Hey there marketing research students and SPSS users. In this set of videos, we'll be learning how to identify and flag poor quality survey data using the craft beer marketing data. We're going to be using SPSS for this exercise. The data file, if you want to play along, is available at this bit.ly link, bad data SPSS. For those of you who've been using and following other videos, this is a different data set than we've been using for other exercises. Make sure you go and grab this one. Starting this video, there's a few things you're going to need to know. You should be familiar with recoding and computing new variables in SPSS. You don't need to be a pro, but you do need to be able to follow along. I move a little quick in some of the spots regarding basic recoding and computing of new variables. Ideally, you'd be vaguely familiar with the online survey software, preferably Qualtrics. Uh, we'll be using a data set that was generated using the Qualtrics online survey system, so you'll be particularly comfortable with the exercise if you're familiar with how Qualtrics generates and creates data sets from online responses. The issue we're trying to solve today is as follows. We know that collecting online survey data of marketing uh, through, for marketing research, however, online survey data is often filled with poor quality data. People take the survey at an unreasonably fast speed, meaning they weren't engaged in the process, meaning we have to be suspicious of the quality of their data. People often go on mental autopilot while completing portions of the survey. Or in other cases, they make complete portions of the survey, however, they really weren't thinking about the questions. They are merely trying to get to the end to get the incentive. Sometimes people provide impossible answers, either because they're not willing to give us the honest answer, or they have the inability to give us an honest answer. So in this set of videos, what we're going to learn are some introductory tips on how to flag survey responses that are likely to be of poor quality. We can then use these flags to filter out those responses for our later analysis. What we're not going to learn today is procedures that guarantee that the good responses and the poor responses are perfectly separated from each other. Unfortunately, when we flag potentially risky data, we're not going to have a guarantee that it really is poor data. There's always going to be a risk that we might be throwing out some of the good data while we're throwing out a large portion of the bad. This is a risk that we have to deal with when we're considering throwing out data in marketing research. We'll consider some of those issues at the very end of this video. So let's familiarize ourselves with the data set that we're going to be using for this exercise. These are 300 responses that were randomly taken from a much larger data set of uh, 21 and older adults in the United States. The topic of this survey was craft beer drinking. Now the original survey was very long, it was over 50 questions in total, but the data set they're going to be using in this exercise is only a small subset of the original uh, questionnaire items. This will be a little more manageable for us as we, as we work through this, this particular task. The variables that we're particularly interested in this case uh, come in a few different uh, flavors. The first set of questions are automatic Qualtrics variable. For example, it tells us what time a person started the survey and what time they finished the survey. It also gives us their IP address. I've removed all of the IP addresses so you can't see them in this particular exercise. The second set of questions, the screening questions, dealt with things like, have you ever drank beer in the last three months? Have you ever had a craft beer in the last three months? These were important because depending on their answers to these questions, they either saw a subset of the entire survey, meaning they didn't say they drank craft beer, we, entire, we skipped over some of the questions about craft beer. The other set of questions that we kept in this particular example is their awareness of breweries. So we had a list of 20 breweries, and we simply asked them whether they were aware or not aware of this brewery. Two of these eight, uh, 20 breweries were actually fake names. We'll see how we use that to our advantage in a moment. Finally, we had a series of 20 Likert sty uh, style scaled questions that dealt with just basic drinking preferences. So let's take a look at that data set. I'm in SPSS right now, and remember I'm in the variable view here, so I'm actually looking at my, the descriptions of my variables running uh, in the rows. And these first variables here, the first 10, are all the automatic Qualtrics variables. Now if you ever de you develop a survey and collect data in Qualtrics yourselves, and open up it up in SPSS, they won't be called Qualtrics underscored. They'll be called v V1, V2, V3 to V10. So I notice here, I note here in the labels that's the original name. And sure enough, we see something like the IP address, uh, start date, and end date. Here's our screening questions right here. Did they have any alcohol in the last three months? Did they have any beer in the last three months? 
we have 20 questions re regarding brewery and awareness. And fake deals with a made up name. In our case, our fake ones are Sun Surf Coast Brewing and Victoria's Power Brewing Company. And who knows, with so many microbreweries and craft breweries opening today, by the time that this uh, is being viewed by you, these breweries may actually exist. But at the time, we, I assure you, they did not actually exist. Finally, we have a, st a series of liquor st uh, style scaled questions regarding beer preference on a range of topics. For example, I, beer, I prefer beer that is not too heavy, so this deals with like taste and what they want to drink. While statements such as craft beer is part of San Diego culture deals with all the things that go around beer other than the actual beer itself. Okay, let's go ahead and create a new variable that flags any respondents in our data set that may have completed the survey too fast uh, for us to trust their responses as credible. If we pre-tested the survey with a subset of respondents, say 20 or 30 participants, and we knew that they were engaged in the task, we usually could establish a minimum time that, peop that people would have to take and spend on the survey while still being actually mentally engaged in the process. So we should have a benchmark available to us that should give us a clue about any participants in our actual data collection who may not have been uh, fully engaged in the process. Now, alternatively, if we didn't do a pretest and we should have done a pretest, uh, an option we might have available to us is we can simply plot or visually inspect the amount of time that all of our participants in the full data set took. And what we'll usually see is there's going to be a little, little cluster of people who spent a very small amount of time at the low end. And we can indicate, and usually it'll be indicated to us that these people may have been sort of super speedsters who didn't really engage in the survey taking process. So let's go ahead and do this process. Now, I'm going to use a series of steps here. And those of you who might be a little more comfortable with SPSS, once you see me walk through this example, you might say to yourself, you know, there's a quicker and faster way I could do these steps. But I think for the exercise here, it's useful to move a little uh, more carefully. So again, I have my data set open, and I'm in the variable view. And I remember that looking at the variable view, I have two variables here called Qualtrics start date and Qualtrics end date. And these are actually saved as date variables. So these are the start time and end time that people took our survey. If we look in the data view and actually inspect these visually, we'll see we have a certain string here where we have day, month, year, with a military time of day here. So this person completed the survey at 1.28 PM and 26 seconds. Because these are in a date format, we can't simply subtract the start time from the end time and derive how much time was spent. We need to use a special tool here. In this case, SPSS makes it easiest for us to deal with dates uh, for addition and subtraction. We can just go to the transform tool right here. And we can go to the date and time wizard. The date and time wizard gives us a bunch of different options. And you can go ahead and read through these. But the one that I want to use here is the calculate with dates and times. I want to do a calculation. I want to subtract uh, when someone started from their ending, which would give me the amount of time they took in between. I want to calculate the number of time units between two dates. So I want to use option two here. And if my ending subtracted from the when they started, that should give me the amount of time in between. I don't want this in years. I sure hope no one took more than zero, zero total years to complete this. I don't want it month, weeks, days, hours. You can ask for it in minutes or seconds. Seconds would be more precise, of course. In this case, uh, in the exercise, I'll just do it in minutes, presuming that uh, this is sufficiently precise to let us know if people didn't take enough time. We'll truncate that to a complete in integer. And for our result variable, we should give it a meaningful name, a time on survey. And for the variable label, I can use spaces if I want. The amount of time someone spent on, uh, on the survey. We can paste this into a new window, but we can also just click create the variable now. Whenever we make a new variable, it should show up at the very far end of our data set. So we can scroll all the way over there. And then we have time on survey, and we have some numbers that at least meet the smell test. They appear to be uh, seemingly credible. Notice we have some zeros, but you'll also notice we have a lot of missing values here. So that seems like someone who didn't actually complete the survey, or maybe was pushed out of the survey because they didn't qualify. 
Now, we're not done though. We can't treat this column as evidence of how much time someone spent on the, sur uh, on the total survey because we really have two subsets of people in this particular survey. We have those people who drink beer, and if they drank beer, they completed the entire survey. But if they responded that they did not drink beer in our screening question, they were only asked a tiny subset of the total questions in our survey. So of course, they didn't spend as much time on the survey because they didn't have to take as long of a survey. So for example, if we scroll over to our screening questions here, you'll notice some missing responses. Ones mean yes, they did in fact drink beer in the last three months. We do have a few people who said no. We have one here, a few here. And those people who said no, well, of course, they're not going to take as long on the survey because we designed this survey so they didn't take as long. So we need to create a new variable that only shows the amount of time spent on the survey for those people who spent, who were supposed to take the entire survey. And this can be easily done by going to transform, recode into different variables. We can select our time on survey variable. And we'll call this time, our new variable will be time on survey beer drinkers. That's a really long name. I should probably give it a shorter name, but we'll live with it for now. Hit change. And we use an if condition here and say include if case satisfies condition. In other words, we're only going to create new variables if a certain condition is true. In this case, I'm going to right click on my variables, display variable names, just toggles between labels and names. For my screening question, any beer, I know that if it equals one, they were supposed to take the entire survey. Therefore, I want to only make this new variable for anybody who actually drank uh, beer in the last three months. And then the rules for the old and new values, well, in this case, any value. All values, copy them over. So what should happen here when I run this is that whatever amount of time someone spent on the survey, it should show that, but it'll only show that if they actually said they drank beer. Otherwise, we should see missing values. So I go ahead and OK and run that. Your output window may have popped up like mine did. I just minimized it. And we see here, looks like it worked carried over all the values except for certain instances and these must be the individuals who didn't actually take the survey or we're not supposed to take the complete survey my apologies all right great we can work from this variable now we know how long people spent on the survey overall let's find out a little bit more about this particular of these uh, these people and how long they took let's go to let's actually just do a simple frequency analysis let's go to analyze descriptives frequencies Time on your survey. And for, stati for statistics, let's ask for cut points for 20 equal groups. So we're going to get a really high resolution sense of how long people spent on our survey here by doing this. And let's also ask for the mean and the median. And hit continue. I think for charts, I have nothing set. You can ask for something if you want. And hit OK. So what do we see here? We see that the mean is 28 minutes spent on our survey. But the median, meaning 50% of our people took less than 11 minutes and above, and the other half took above 11 minutes, clearly this mean must be getting dragged forward by some far outliers who took an extremely long amount of time on our survey. And this normally does, by the way, you're almost always going to see this in an online survey. Why? Well, what usually happens is either somebody might leave a tab open in their web browser and only get through 90% of the survey, then maybe five or six hours later, later they come back and they hit the OK button and close it. So our system sees it as a six hour long survey. Uh, another option is the person does actually complete the survey, say, in 10 minutes, but when they get to the final thank you page, 
they may not actually have closed out or uh, hit the exit button and they just lingered at that page and as far as the Qualtrics system is concerned that person's still taking the survey so we might see a report of you know say 240 minutes when in reality the person actually only spent 11 minutes it's not a it's not perfect so no surprise we see our mean being far above our median if we look at our percentiles a few things should pop out at us we can see right here we have a very unsure enough you can see the same thing here where the overall majority of people, even up to the 85th percentile here, took less than 22 minutes. And then we start seeing these long amount of time being spent over here. And we see some really quick survey takers down here in this bottom 10%, spending one, two, four and a half, six minutes. Hmm. So if we had not done a pretest, and we should have done a pretest, we would have to do our best guess about if we really want to trust these groups. Now knowing that it was a 50 question, multi, uh, 50 question survey, it's almost certain that anybody who took less than two minutes did not credibly take the entire survey. So we might be comfortable in cutting off this bottom 10% of our, uh, of our completed data set. Of course we lose a bunch of data, but on the other hand, this is probably really poor data. I'm having a hard time imagining too many scenarios with a, where a 50 question multiple choice uh, questionnaire can be completed in two minutes credibly. But what we really should do is we, if we had that pretest, and we did do a pretest, we learned through that pretest that even for people who were really, really fast at the survey and really answered quickly, nobody broke the seven minute barrier in terms of completing the questionnaire. So when we look at this, we realize, oh wow, somewhere around, somewhere a little more than 20% of all of our data took less than seven minutes to complete the survey. Wow, almost, almost a quarter of our data set may be junk data merely because we know they didn't spend enough time focusing on the survey. This isn't too shocking. This was a long survey, so people may have zoned out at some point, started uh, just clicking through. Secondly, our incentive wasn't very strong in this particular uh, study that we did. It was a very small gift certificate. And thirdly, there's a lot of scenarios where we don't have institutional controls here. The person could take the questionnaire at any time they wanted, so they may simply have left. We didn't have them sitting in a computer lab and forcing them to take the survey. So it's not entirely shocking that we might have to cut off a lot of this data. Let's make a variable that actually signals this to us. Let's imagine that either through inspecting these data points or through our knowledge of our pretest, we decided that anyone who spent less than seven minutes on our survey, we don't want to include in our main analysis. In this case, we can simply complete this activity by going to transform, recode into different vari variables. We can clear out our old variable that we already had made. We'll use this newest variable, the time on survey, only for the beer drinkers. We'll call this new variable um, bad data screen underscore time. Remember, I'm using underscores, no spaces. You gotta, can't use spaces. And for our old and new values, if anybody was from the lowest value possible up to the value 7, our new value will be 1. 1 being a simple flag saying, yes, this person might be bad data. Any other value, we'll score that as a 0. So we're going to create a simple nominal two-category variable, 1 meaning, yes, these people might be bad data because they're missing, and zero meaning, no, I'm sorry, not missing, because they spent too little time on the survey, and zero meaning, at least with respect to the amount of time they spent on the survey, we think this data is clean. Okay, and run this. And ta-da, we have made our bad data flag. From here on out, it's very easy for us to just go to data, select cases, and say we only want to analyze anybody that's equal to zero for our select cases condition. So now you can see, because I used data, select cases, the fields where people were scored as zeros here, meaning they're good, were kept in the system, whereas the ones who were flagged as bad are crossed off.
Now, let's scan for straight lining behavior in our survey, which is another piece of evidence that suggests we may have bad quality data coming from a particular respondent. Straight lining is one type of occurrence that occurs in surveys when someone becomes mentally disengaged from the survey, but they finish it anyways. Typically, what they will do in these cases is if we have a series of different questionnaire items all using the same scale, they will respond the exact same way to every single one of these items. For example, in our particular survey here, we have a series of questions all related to beer drinking that are all measured using a Likert scale, including an I don't know option. One example of straight lining behavior here would be if someone said they strongly agree to every single one of these statements. Again, this isn't guaranteed evidence that the participant did not fully engage. Maybe they really do strongly agree to every single comment. But if we inspect our particular questionnaire items a little closer, we realize it's difficult for us to be willing to assume that someone would strongly agree to every single one of these statements. Consider the following. This statement here says it's important for a beer to have a high alcohol content. Someone could certainly strongly agree to that. However, if we then ask them, the taste of a beer is more important than the buzz from the alcohol. We would suspect that in most cases, someone wouldn't strongly agree to both these statements. Again, it's not impossible for someone to agree with both these things. This isn't guaranteed evidence that they are not, that they are uh, disengaged from the survey. But if you scan through all the rest of these questionnaire items, you'll notice it becomes increasingly difficult for us to be willing to accept that they would strongly agree to every single one of these statements. So let's create a straight lining indicator in our data set so that we can investigate these particular cases further. We're now in SPSS. We're in the variable view for our data set. And we'll keep in mind that the beer preference questions are all in order from beer pref drink to beer pref friend. And we're going to take advantage of SPSS's compute function. To create this indicator, we will simply go to transform, compute variable. And in this case, let's call this beer pref underscore variance. And we're going to take advantage of the statistical property of the variance measure. We know that if someone just responds the exact same way to every single one of these questions, whether they answered strongly disagree to all of them or strongly agree to all of them, the variance for that particular person will be zero. So if you look in our function group here, there's probably a variance measure somewhere here. And sure enough, there's a function for variance variance with two parentheses, and it's asking for us to include all the variables that we'd like to have included in the variance estimate. We're going to do this the easy way. So we're going to delete these all out, just leaving the parentheses. We'll scroll down to our beer motivation, our beer preference questions here. I'll click. So beer pref drink was our first question. I'll add a space, and then I'll add the phrase to, and I'll include the very last beer preference measure, which is beer pref friend. By using the to, fun the, the to command here, we're telling SPSS for every variable that's in between these two variables, calculate, include them in the calculation for the variance. OK, we can go ahead and run this. We just created our beer pref variance measure right here. Let's go to the data view and visually inspect it. Far right, final column, we see our beer pref variance. We see a series of values that are not zero, meaning there was some variance amongst people on how they responded to those beer pref questions. We notice there's some missing values here. These missing values are whenever somebody did not respond to every single one of these beer preference questions. Why did someone not respond to every single one of these? Well, these are the respondents that didn't have to take this portion of the survey because they don't drink beer. That works to our advantage, because we don't want to flag these people as straight liners. They simply never were asked the question. So we'll exploit that to our advantage. Do we see anybody that had straight lining behavior? Sure enough, we do. We see respondent uh, in the 19th row here, responded three, or neither uh, agree nor disagree to every single one of these items. OK, so from here, we'll recode into a new variable, taking these zeros and turning them into ones, and all other values turning them into zeros. So we want to create another flag, just like we did with, our, with the bad data for screening for the time, the time that someone took on the survey. So we simply go to transform, 
recode into different variables. We'll clear out if we have anything in, in this area. We'll take our beer pref variance as our input variable. And we'll make a new one, and we'll call this one bad data underscore straight line. Go ahead and hit change. And then we'll go ahead and hit all the new values. Now, if we ever see a value of zero, we want this to turn into a one. So whenever someone had zero variance on their measures, we want to flag them using the indicator of one, letting us know that they are now being flagged as straight liners for these 20 questions. All other values can simply be coded as a zero, meaning that they don't exhibit the straight lining behavior that we're measuring. And we can go ahead and hit OK. Let's go ahead and visually inspect that and see how it worked out. Did it work? Looks like it worked just fine. Our zeros are now ones. Notice that our uh, missing values here are zeros because all we said all other values, which includes missing, should be now coded as zero. And pretty good. So it looks like we have flagged our tiny handful of straight liners in this particular case. Again, we need to be careful and remember that just because people straight lined on this particular uh, set of questions, it doesn't guarantee that they were disengaged from the survey. But now we're building up increasing amounts of evidence that someone may be a straight liner. So we can think now we at least have a single variable in our data set that allows us to constructively debate and think about whether or not these, are, these people are evidence of poor, uh, poor or high quality data. OK, in this exercise, let's create a, a variable that flags a respondent who gave some impossible answers to these questions. In many marketing research studies and questionnaires, we often place Confederate objects among the questions, such as a fake brand. If people say they're aware or familiar with of this fake brand or fake brands, it does give some evidence that they could be giving us, providing us with bad data. For example, we asked respondents about 20 different breweries, and we simply asked them if they're familiar with the brewery or not familiar with the brewery. In two instances, Sun Surf Coast and Victorious Power, these are fake breweries. Now it's entirely possible that someone could misremember. They could be familiar with these breweries, but in reality they've never seen them before. So again, we have to be careful. We're going to flag these as indicators of potentially bad data, but we're not going to make the deterministic decision that guarantees this is poor data. It's pretty straightforward to create an indicator for these two. We know that if they're familiar with this brewery, it's been coded as a 1 in our data set. And if they're not familiar, it's been coded as a 0. So we'll simply go to Transform, Compute Variable. I'll hit Reset here to clear out my uh, previous exercise. In this case, we'll make a new variable called sum underscore fake brew, where we'll just add up the score from the two fake breweries. Go ahead and hit OK. Let's take a look at our results. Looking at our results here, we can see that some people had missing data. This means that they did not respond to either one or both of those particular questions because the addition computation can't execute unless we have valid data in both. That's how SPSS works. Zero would mean that they said they were not familiar with both. One meaning they're familiar with one. Two meaning they said they were familiar with both of these fake breweries. In this case, we're going to be take a strict standpoint here and say we're only going to flag as a potential risk those who scored a 2. If someone scored a 1, they were familiar with one of the fake breweries but not familiar with the other. That would be indicative that they were thinking through their evaluation of these, of these breweries, but they just may have misremembered. In this case, again, they may have misremembered, but we have a little more evidence that they may not have been fully engaged in the process. So in this case, we go to transform, recode into different variables, hit reset, simply grab our new summated variable, and we'll call this one bad data, fake brew, brewery, <laughs> hit change, for order new values, a 2, meaning they said both, we're familiar with both, it's now coded as a 1, all other values will flag as a 0. and run that. 
there we go. We've created our bad data fake brewery flag. So now we should have three different bad data flags. Now, quickly, I'd like to mention there's one other approach we could have taken to the fake brewery here. Let's take a let's take a look again at that those questions. Another option we have here is we could have taken the average of all of the questions, and since it, there's only scores of one and zero, an average score of one here would be indicative that they said they were familiar with every brewery. We could have used that as another uh, flag, sort of a hybrid between them identifying breweries that don't exist and a straight lining behavior. So we could have used that as another alternative approach, which again has its own uh, flaws as well, but that's another way we could have tried to deal with this. And again, we could have made that as a fourth bad data flag if we have chosen to do so. Finally, after we've computed all of our bad data risk variables, we now need to identify our particularly high risk cases that, that indicate multiple properties of bad data. What we're going to do is create a single variable that indicates how many times an individual respondent was flagged for potentially bad data. So in our case, we have three different bad data indicators. We'll simply sum up those three uh, zero, one codes to find uh, which individuals were identified zero, one, two, or three times as potentially uh, bad data indicators. We're going to investigate those results with the frequency table and we'll make a decision about how to handle that, uh, those potentially bad data points. And then, which is not covered in this video, we will proceed with understanding how to analyze and report our data when, when we might be filtering out uh, potentially bad data. When we're conducting our analysis and writing our report, first, we need to be clear about any filters that we apply to our data, in other words, CYA, which we all know means cover your assumptions. Ultimately, these bad data indicators do not guarantee that we're dealing with bad data. They're merely indicative of likelihood of bad data. Therefore, we need to be clear that we are making some assumptions, and we need to be clear to anyone reading our report what assumptions were that we made when we filtered out these cases. That at least lets them know that if they are suspicious of our results, they can actually point to one of, the, one of the reasons that they may be suspicious. Secondly, ideally, another thing that we should do is we should test all of our results for sensitivity to our filtering assumptions. Put another way, we should run all of our analysis with our filters, our data filters on for bad data, and then we should take them off and run the results, uh, I'm sorry, run the analysis again. If the substantive implications of our result, uh, of our analysis doesn't change whether we are filtering or not filtering for bad data, at least we can be a little more confident that if we made a mistake with our uh, data filter assumptions, it doesn't really change the implications uh, that we might report to managers. So let's go ahead and create that final bad data indicator here. It's very easy to do. Simply go to compute, transform, compute variable. And we'll call this bad data underscore sum. We'll find our, our sum function here. And our sum function is simply bad data screen time, our new variable, comma, bad data straight line, comma, bad data fake brewery. Since these are all coded as a 0 to 1 already, we know that we should be, for each respondent, we should get a value between 0 and 3. Go ahead and run this. Our bad data sum variable ran. Let's do a quick frequency table and see what the overall pattern of potential bad data looked like. Analyze, descriptives, frequencies. And let's go ahead and grab our bad data sum variable here and we'll show our display or frequency table. We're interested in the frequency table at the bottom here. When we look at this, we see that zero people actually were flagged for all three bad data indicators. Three individuals were flagged for two, and 71 were flagged as a, for a single bad indicator. In this case, we probably decide that at least these individuals that were flagged twice should be filtered out. Whereas these individuals, these 71 individuals who are flagged one or more times, uh, I'm sorry, one time only, may or may not need to be included. In most cases, if you remember from earlier, these individuals with only one instance are almost entirely individuals who did the survey much too quickly. So perhaps we set too high of a threshold and we really do have some participants who took the survey very fast, but nonetheless provided us with high quality data.